So, as part of a short series of tutorials for Lord of the Flies, particularly for those of you who are revising, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the philosophy um, within Lord of the Flies. All good authors are philosophers, um, and a, a really important question to ask is what actually is philosophy? Um, and for the purposes of literature, Philosophy is those big questions about humanity that literature seeks to answer, so all good authors are philosophers, um, and all good characters explore something about either the failings of humankind or the successes of humankind, and that's what really makes literature relatable, and for Lord of the Flies, that's a big reason why we still study it. Um, so, really, when we think about Lord of the Flies, we've got to think about the human responses to the situation that the boys all find themselves in. And before we do this, I just want to ask you some questions about sort of the current situation and I suppose why I'm here talking to you in this way rather than in front of a classroom. When you think about everything that you've heard, everything that you've read, all of the news that you've watched and everything that you've witnessed about how people have responded to the coronavirus outbreak, what does it make you think about humans? What does it make you think about people? Do you think it's brought out the best in people? Do you think it's brought out what kindness mankind has the capacity for? Or do you think it's brought out how people have been selfish, stockpiling toilet paper and baby food, meaning that other people can't access it? Has it made people think in the interest of their community or perhaps in the interest of themselves? And it's that question really that Lord of the Flies explores in terms of what makes us human, what do we all have in common and what does that say about us as a civilization? Can we even call ourselves a civilization? So essentially Lord of the Flies presents the island as a microcosm of society and it asks us how do we behave when society is taken away? How are we conditioned by society without even realising it? And I suppose most crucially, without anybody there to be a natural voice of authority, where does that authority come from? Where does power come from? And what does it make people do? So, as most of you will have studied already, there are three quite significant philosophers who all seek to answer this question. So the first one is John Locke. So John Locke, with an E, talks about humanity as being a blank slate. So he says we're all born a blank slate, this tabula rasa, as he calls it. That's the Latin phrase. Um, and essentially what that means is that all of our experiences, all of the things that we go through in life kind of leave a mark on us and that sort of builds to become the person that we are. So that's one option for what makes us human, what humans are really like. Rousseau, a French philosopher, essentially he coined this phrase that humanity is a noble savage. And what that means is, if you make man a savage, if you take away society and all of those rules that we all live by, take away the law, we're noble, we're good fundamentally our consciences make us good people and he actually thinks that society itself is the problem so society makes us dissatisfied with what we've got society makes us jealous of other people and that's what makes us act in a negative way and then Hobbes our third key philosopher to answer this question of what humanity is really like he thinks that society actually is required so he thinks that humans are naturally selfish. He thinks that we're naturally violent. And if left to our own devices without any of those rules, we would act in a way that was savage. So after reading Lord of the Flies, which most of you hopefully will have done by this point, it's quite obvious that Golding himself sort of leaned towards Hobbes's view that we are actually quite selfish when we're left to our own devices. That's our natural inclination. Um, and this is linked to his life experiences. So he was a teacher. He was a teacher in all boys schools. And as you can imagine, he saw some quite sort of negative behaviour, some quite violent behaviour 
towards each other even at a young age and that's perhaps why he chose to have these young boys marooned on the island rather than sort of fully grown adults. Um, another important thing to know about Golding is that he joined the Navy in World War II and his experiences of war really sort of shaped the way that he wrote particularly this novel. Um, and he said, I'm going to read this because I want to get it word perfect, he said that during the war he saw man's capacity for evil and the way that he put it is that man produces evil as a bee produces honey. So that natural imagery shows just how Golding himself believed that we need something to sort of contain and control those negative impulses that we have because otherwise society wouldn't work. Society is about a community and acting in the best interests of people other than ourselves. Interestingly though, despite the fact that Golding seems to fall on one side of this debate, his characters don't and I think that's what makes it such an interesting novel to read and to study and to really think deeply about. So it essentially shows everybody's capacity for evil. Every single person has a capacity for evil, but that doesn't make them evil people. We see that even the goodies can become baddies if they think they're justified or in certain circumstances. So even characters like Piggy and the really young children, the little ones, end up being brought into this sort of absolutely pandemic, savage behaviour um, involving killing and torturing other people um, and it's really important to notice that the character that we would associate as being purely good is Simon and Simon can't survive on the island and that's no accident on Golding's part. Simon is not built for the kind of um, sort of Darwinistic ideas that the island brings. He's not built for survival of the fittest because he absolutely embodies that idea of the good of the community, the good of his fellow man. Um, and that's why I think he meets quite a sticky end, really. Um, that's by no means all of the philosophical ideas contained within Lord of the Flies, but it's just a nice sort of few snippets for you to bear in mind, particularly when you're analysing those characters, because examiners absolutely love for you to think about the wider context in terms of the thinking behind the characterisation and the thinking behind the driving of the plot towards that dramatic conclusion where the island is on fire and they're all being punished for the sort of absolutely feral behaviour that they've all turned to. So I hope that kind of jogged some of your memories and I hope that that gives you some really useful things to link to your analysis and your study of the characters and the plot of the novel.